I'm Rachel Barenbaum, author of A Bend in the Stars, and I am so, so excited about my guest today, Judy Battalion. Her amazing book, The Light of Days, I could not put it down. She is brilliant. This book is brilliant. There's so much here. Like, I barely slept last night getting ready for this interview. <laughs> Judy, tell me, what is your book about? Um... First of all, thank you so much for having me here. I'm very excited to be here. I barely slept for the past two months either. Um, my book <laughs> is about um, young Jewish women who fought the Nazis and primarily who fought the Nazis from the Polish ghettos. And uh, I see in the background there, you have two covers, right? Because the YA version came out at the same time as the adult version. Talk about that. That's amazing. Yes. There's a young reader's edition and it's intended for ages 10 to 14. And yeah, it came out the same time. So you can do a, a whole family book club event. And the Spielberg movie is coming. Fingers crossed. Um, I am co-writing the screenplay. That's actually what I've been doing all week, uh, working on that. Amazing. So um, one of the things about this book that really just amazes me is the way that you found your subject. Can you talk about how you came across these women? Yeah, for sure. I, I found this book started 14 years ago. Um, people are calling it an odyssey. It's been an odyssey. And it happened completely by accident. This is one of those serendipitous research finds. I was living in London at the time, I was thinking a lot about my Jewish identity, um, but I, I was really thinking about what I call the emotional legacy of the Holocaust, the way that trauma passes over generations. I was trying to understand if my own extreme anxiety actually came from my Holocaust heritage. Um, so I was trying to, I, I was thinking around those more psychological issues. This led me to the British Library, long story short, I happened to come across an unusual book. It was an old, you know, dusty book in a blue fabric cover with gold embossed writing on the front. And it was in Yiddish. It was called Freuen in the Ghettos, Women in the Ghettos. Um, but I always say even more unusual is the fact that I speak Yiddish. So I just, I was like intrigued um, by this object really. And I started flipping through the book and Lo and behold, this was a 200 page small script Yiddish book uh, listing dozens and dozens of young Jewish women who fought the Nazis with chapter titles like ammunition, weapons, partisan combat. I had never read anything like this in, in tone and in content. It was so unique. I knew it was, I knew it was special. I knew I, I found a treasure and, and that's where it all began. It's just amazing. I mean, before I read this book, I had never known any women resistors other than Hannah Senesch, really. Women fighters, like, you just blew my mind. I mean, why were all of these women's stories hidden, covered up, lost? What happened? All right, so that's like a two-hour Zoom session that we could do <laughs> on that minute. question. But in one minute, here's the answer. Um, and I do get into this more in the book, of course. So uh, buy the book. But yeah, uh, buy the there, book. Buy the book. There, there are many reasons. Part of it is because the Jewish resistance in the Holocaust is under discussed, and women's experience in the Holocaust is under discussed. And here's a story of Jewish women resistors. So. And the reasons that these have, stories have been repressed for so long, partially their political reasons, the, the politics of different countries have shaped the narrative of the Holocaust, particular in Israel and in Poland. Um, some of the reasons are zeitgeist, like we've just been interested in different elements of the Holocaust at different times. We've also been uncomfortable talking about different elements of the Holocaust at different times. Um, but a lot of it is personal. A lot of it is that these women didn't tell their story or they told it and then they stopped telling it. And this is because they were not believed. This is because they were accused of sleeping their way to safety or of having collaborated or done something conniving to survive. They were accused because they were resistors of fleeing to fight instead of, instead of helping their families um, or else they perceived that. Many of them, they suffered from really pungent survivor's guilt. So even though they were 
you know, literally shooting Gestapo men in the head, blowing up Nazi trains, running underground schools and bulletins and, and printing presses, they felt that compared to their survivor peers who, who had been through Auschwitz, they, they hadn't had it that bad. And they almost felt they didn't merit telling their story. They hadn't suffered enough. Um, and then for a lot of them, they were very young in the war when they did this work and they had their whole lives ahead of them. And many of them really, really deeply needed to start fresh. They wanted to have children, raise the, this new Jewish generation in a healthy, normal uh, environment. And, and because of that, they themselves silenced their stories. Some of those reasons just, you know, as I was reading the book, they're like heartbreaking. And yet I understand also why so many survivors talk about wanting to move on, right? Even though they did these tremendous things, but wow, just what you uncovered. So um, one of the things that has really stuck with me from this book, and I literally have been like talking about this nonstop with my friends, right? They're like enough already, is, is why women were so well suited to be, um, you know, sort of sneaking out of the ghettos and trying to blend in to assimilate, right? So that they could do these missions. And you explain, well, of course, um, women were not circumcised, right? So they couldn't drop their pants, the test there. But even more um, it, it, amazingly is that mostly the women were sent to, or the as kids, as young girls were sent to secular Polish schools while their brothers went to Jewish yeshivas or schools. Um, and so they grew up knowing how to be Polish. And you know, this just sort of blew my mind. And I had to ask you, like, how did you figure that out? <laughs> like, you know, how did that come to you? First of all, I'm gonna take you on all my interviews with me because you're you're getting the answers better better than I do. Thank you for explaining that so well. Um, how did I figure that out? They talk about this in their memoirs. And there's been a little bit of, a little bit of, I mean, I'm obsessed with Poland in the 1930s. That's like my new, my new thing. And there's been very little written about that era um, because of what's, what's it, you know, it's been eclipsed by, by the Holocaust, but really a fascinating time period. Um, and they were women, again, there was mandatory education for boys, girls, Poland was very progressive relatively at that time. Um, and they talk a lot in their memoirs, in their testimonies about how they, they, about going to Polish public schools, about um, how they understood, you know, Polish customs, Polish um, nuances that the, I, I, I always say, look at me in the Zoom screen, I'm gesticulating. That was very Jewish. They, one of them talked about how she had to wear a muff when she went out on missions to control her hand movement. Um, so they themselves talk about it. There's been a little tiny, tiny bit of scholarship around Jewish women in the in the 1930s and and how much more assimilated women were than men. It's just an incredible fact. So, okay, I would be remiss as an interviewer if I didn't also point out how many languages did you use while you were researching and, and interviewing families for this book? Um, so a lot. I mean, obviously English, uh, Yiddish, Hebrew. Polish, which I don't speak, so I had translators. There was a little bit of German, a little bit of Russian. Also, I had, uh, I, I, I do some German from the Yiddish, um, but I had some help with those languages. But yes, it was a complicated project to do. Amazing. And for um, any of our viewers or listeners who don't know, Yiddish is actually written with the Hebrew alphabet, right? So you were reading multiple alphabets too, Cyrillic for Russian. I mean, just wow. Um, okay, so let's go back to these women, right, and assimilating young girls, um, because really what was driving, the driving force behind the resistance, as you point out, is, is these youth movements that everyone was a part of. And as Americans, um, as, as an American, youth movements were very new to me, um, actually, until um, I lived in Israel for a while, and my kids were a part of youth groups there, and they were like the backbone of life in Israel. But here in America, they're really not. Um, and it, you know that's what drove those resistance groups. Um, so can you talk about those youth groups and where are they today? Yeah, that's a great question. And this brings me back to my obsession with 1930s Poland. So Polish Jewish youth, even Polish youth was largely organized into youth groups, Jewish youth in particular. And these groups, they were like the scouts, but more so. They were spiritual, intellectual, emotional, social, 
training grounds for late teenagers, Jews in their early 20s. They used to joke that their last name was the name of their youth group. They were so, their identity was constructed, was shaped by which group they were part of. These groups were, they came, they were affiliated with political slants, with political philosophies. Um, the ones that I write about in particular were socialist and secular youth movements. They believed in um, you know, the pursuit of truth, pride in our Jewish heritage, uh, psychology, psychoanalysis. They talked a lot about their strengths, their weaknesses, this emotional awareness, self-awareness. They were socialists. They believe in collaboration and collectivism. And many of these young Jews, they even left their family home, this is before the war, and moved into communes or kibbutzim, which were all over Poland. And in these kibbutzim, yes, who knew? So in these communes, the, these young Jews, first of all, they really bonded with each other. They developed trust and they learned to work together. Um, they, they talked about how to work together. They also prided physicality, self-sufficiency. They did athletics, they worked the land. It was important to be physically strong too. Um, and so all these factors together really primed them to becoming underground resistance cells. They were very organized. It's amazing because I also feel like we hear a lot of excuses in the U.S., especially in the Northeast, like, oh, they're kids, they're teenagers, right? Let them be kids. But here we are talking about teenagers leading the resistance, right? Running these youth groups. They are really, right, the, the ones running all of this. It just was mind-blowing. Yeah, at so what was the most surprising thing that you found doing all of this research? I can't even imagine, like, what blew your mind? I don't know. This was the kind of project where, like, every day I was calling my husband or my friends, like, you can't believe what I found out! <laughs> um, after which point, they're like, your friends were like, <laughs> um, uh, But, you know, everything surprised me. And, you know, what can I say? The scope of Jewish resistance surprised me. I heard of Hannah Senesh. I heard of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. I didn't know that over 90 European ghettos had armed resistance units. I didn't know 30,000 Jews joined the partisans. You know, these rescue networks helped tens of thousands of Jews in hiding. There, there were much bigger numbers than I, than I ever imagined. I was stunned by, I mean, as I said, I'm obsessed with the 1930s now. I didn't understand the Poland that these Jews grew up in. And I, I, I'm really interested in that now and in how, how contemporary that time was, how it feels so similar to our time now. Um, I mean, I was surprised by every single story that I read and that is hundreds of them. You know, these are Jewish women, you know, getting jobs working for the Gestapo, stealing their documents, being in, uh, a Gestapo man has a crush on her. She invites her to the Christmas party. She comes with all these undercover couriers. They're taking photos. I have a photo of that in the book. You know, the, the detail, the, the audacity, uh, the, you know, who, the drama and life of these stories. And I think going back to that Yiddish book that I found, what amazed me was, sure, the narratives and the content, but also it was so live, it was so alive, it was lively, it was stories of movement, of people. And somehow that, you know, it jolted me. I, I was, I was used to reading, I, I imagined this would be a book of mourning, a book of gloom, a book that was very staid. And instead it, it was not at all. These stories are full of action and, and humanity. And, and maybe that's what surprised me the most. That's such a beautiful answer. Cause I think that's how, that's what I was most surprised about too, that energy. And, and I love by the way that you're dropping all these little gems that everyone will yeah. find as they read the book because it just, right? It is a page turner in that sense. So what do you want readers to take away? Oi, a <laughs> hard one. <laughs> I mean, I think there, there are two things, I, I guess, if I hope. One, one of them is that, you know, these women had, I mean, nothing. They were starving. They had, their families were murdered they knew they weren't gonna topple the Nazis. They used to joke, our whole weapons cache fits into a basket. Like we're not, we're not an army, 
but that didn't matter. It didn't matter. They still went out there day after day, risking their lives to fight, to fight for justice, to fight for liberty, to fight for their convictions. And these small acts, they matter. They matter to them. They matter to the people around them. They matter to me. I hope to us today. And that's, I, I think, in my most global general takeaway would be, you know, we must fight for what we believe in. We must fight for freedom. And, and, and it, even if we can't take down the whole regime, we, we, we do what we can. Um, and then I think on a personal level also, I think I too, and this sort of goes what I was saying to the last question, I think I too, even though my grandparents are Holocaust survivors, I myself had been, I don't know, somehow uh, had swallowed this myth of Jewish passivity in the war. And, you know, as I said, when I started this, it was about, you know, uh, I was looking at trauma and how trauma passed through generations. And I'm sort of coming out of this, yes, I think trauma did pass through generations, but so did strength. And so did passion and fury and compassion. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm so proud of my legacy. And I, I want, I don't know, I don't know if that's a takeaway, but I hope it is for readers to feel proud of their heritage and proud of their history and to know that even if we, we come from a history of, of trauma, we also come from strength. And, and I'm trying to hold those both together. I love that. I'm going to make my kids listen to that answer. <laughs> that was really, really good. Um, okay, so last, yeah, good work. I passed. <laughs> All right, so my last question for you is, uh, what kind of advice do you have for people who are setting out and trying to write nonfiction? Uh, people ask me that question and I, I'm, I'm, I'm always like, I never have good enough advice to give. I, so my, the main thing I always say is read nonfiction and fiction and read critically. So I, and I'm a bit embarrassed to admit this, but even now I still keep like a reading log of all the books I read and like what works in them for me and what doesn't work. And that's what I encourage people to think, to read, but also to think what works for you, what worked in this book and what really didn't work in this book. And think about it, I, I don't know, think about it that way and, and then help, let that help shape your work, shape, shape your writing. Um, on a very practical note, I am someone who I absolutely 1 million percent need to have external deadlines. I'm not self mo like I can't just sit down and work. I need to know that I have two weeks and that's it. And, you know, even creating a bit of a stressful situation for myself, my husband thinks I'm nuts, but I actually need that. Something, you know, to know that something is going to reach another reader even if it's a friend, even if it's my husband who wants to kill me already, even, you know, I have to create that environment so that I get it done so that I, you know, took us in the chair and I get it done. And, and that's, you know, not for everyone, but for some people, maybe that's, that's a helpful tip. Judy, thank you so much for your time today. I absolutely love the book. I love you. I hope everyone goes out, buys a copy, reads it right away. Mazel tov. Thank you so many, many times. Thank you so much, and I love you too.